Vivian, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super pumped to chat. Thank you so much for having me here, Stephanie. I'm really excited to be able to just have a really fun conversation with you. Me too. And we were <laughs> we were just chatting off, off air, like before I hit record. And I always tell Bryce, like one of the biggest challenges of doing this where I get to connect with agents just across the country is I feel like I have really good friends that I never get to see. So now that we get to like have an actual chance to like have a great conversation, I'm super excited. But you are such an impressive real estate agent to me and you just have such a great energy and vibe about you and you're so dedicated on the things that are important to you that I wish that we were geographically closer so we could actually really have a little bit of more of, of that interaction together. But I'll settle for a podcast for now. So thanks for joining me on the show. Um, for, for those who haven't yet met you, would you mind just sharing a little bit about your story, where you're at, and kind of how you got started in the business? Yeah, so my name is Vivian Arona. I currently live in Tampa, Florida. Um, I'm actually originally from South America, and my family and I moved to California, and I grew up there pretty much all my life. And then um, I met my husband um, through mutual friends in the music industry and we connected and that's how I actually ended up here in Florida because he was originally from Tampa. So we did the whole long distance thing for a while. Um, and then we said, something's got to get because long distance is definitely um, challenging. So I ended up moving here when we got engaged and we've been married for just over seven years. And so I've been in the Tampa area just a little bit over seven and a half years. Um, and I guess my start in real estate really kind of just stems from my family. Um, my grandfather had multiple investment properties all throughout California and parts of Washington. And I was always just kind of intrigued by real estate as, you know, a teen and growing up and probably like most people really enjoyed watching like the home renovation shows and all those things. And um, went to school, got my bachelor's degree in project management. And in the back of my mind was always interested in real estate. So when I graduated college, I had a lot of health issues and um, had to go through a whole health healing protocol journey. And at that point, my functional medicine doctor said, like, listen, if you're going to be at a traditional corporate nine to five job, you're going to have a really difficult time with your healing journey just because of the stress level and with all the other things I had going on, you know, personally and um, in volunteer work that my husband and I do here in our local community. And um, it was just one of those things that straight after college kind of put going straight into the corporate world on the back burner, did my whole healing journey. And at that point I was working for a record label more as like a freelance type of position and um, started there as an intern in college and ended up getting hired permanently within the company and worked there for several years. And then fast forward to the pandemic, um, I was, you know, lead sales uh, manager for their record label. Um, and I basically handled like all the PR sales packages for artists um, all over the world, Latin Grammy uh, nominated artists and independent artists. And the main source of income for most um, musicians is their tours and things like that. Well, obviously, when the entire world shuts down, they have limited income and limited funds to be able to hire a very uh, boutique luxury record label for their services. Yes. So when you're at a commission based position on something that, you know, relies on somebody's income from travel, you kind of start realizing like, Hey, maybe this isn't going to be feasible long-term. So just having conversations with my husband, we said, Hey, you know, I've always wanted to do real estate. Um, I thought it's a really exciting career because there's so many facets and so many different avenues that you can really get into and why not just start now and so I did my online classes and got licensed right away um, but didn't really start working full-time in the, the business until 2021 
Um, but that's kind of where I got my start with within the real estate industry. Oh my gosh, that's that's such a journey. And I love how um, you kind of had to follow where life took you, right? And until that opportunity came up for you to say like, you know what, this is kind of what I want to do now. And and I want to take a leap and really, you know, put myself out there. So, so how did it go? You had your first full year. Um, what was, what was a little bit about starting your business in that first year? Was it the team? Was it the going solo? Tell me a little bit about, um, how you got started. Yeah. So I got my license November, 2020 and signed on to a brokerage like, um, that November, Oh, excuse me. I got my license September and then signed on with the brokerage in November. Didn't really do much during the holidays and all that. And I had other commitments and obligations. So didn't really start doing anything until like February. And I started as a solo agent and, um, you know, just really tried to hit the ground running And it was a very weird time within the real estate industry because that was right before everything just like went crazy with the seller's market. And so I had multiple agents within the office that would see me show up and just try to do something to generate business. And a couple of agents would say like, would you be a showing agent or, or a buyer's agent? And got started that way. But I felt like I really wanted more so a team, um, just leadership and direction. And so it kind of all happened really naturally. I was asked to do an open house for a specific team leader and it just kind of evolved that way. And they just kept saying, we really want you on our team. And this isn't really like a traditional team in the team sense of the word. It's more so a group of people under a team name. And it's more like you put into it what you want and you're going to get out of it, you know, what you put into it. So you can take mentorship, help training. Um, So there's people who've been in the business forever and they're on our team and then there's newer agents. Um, So at the time I was, you know, the youngest agent on our team and um, really connected with my team leader. And she was really a big part of just, I guess my success within the first year, just guiding and mentorship wise in that way. But you know, at the end of the year, I felt like I wanted to take my business to the next level, more so in the social media and online presence aspect of things. And I didn't really know how to go about that. And so that's kind of like how I ended up finding you in the market authority and your YouTube channel. Um, Cause I was Googling one day, like real estate agent uh, routines or schedules. <laughs> I love planning and schedules and that's how I stumbled upon your YouTube channel. And I ended up finding you and we had a one-on-one consultation. I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to get my business to the next level. And I realized that I needed to really like do that and to get to the next level, like why reinvent the wheel? If somebody has already had a successful business and has all the tools and systems so that's just kind of like how it evolved, um, you know, in, in joining the market authority. I love that. So I was, I was actually just looking back cause I was texting you before we hopped on. Cause there was a couple of minutes late. I was trying to get my toddler <laughs> contained and I looked at our text thread. And the first time that we had texted was like, literally, I think it was December 29th um, yeah. of last year. So it was like right at the end of the year. When you were looking at the next year, so starting your second full year in the business, what, which would be now, what would, what were some of the goals that you had on the forefront of your mind? Um, We've talked, you know, just you and you and me about this, but um, was it really pivoting where your leads were coming from? Was it feeling more of a sense of ownership of your business? Like internally, when you were trying to figure out what you wanted 2022 to look like, what were some of those really driving factors for you? So first of all, um, I wanted to be able to generate my own leads and kind of have it on autopilot, if that makes sense. Um, more so, like we all hear the buzzword like passive income, like generating wealth by you know multiple streams of income. And that's kind of how I saw my real estate business because I realized you're only going to get what you put into it 
um, and the effort and time. And I realized I'm only one person and I can only put in X amount of hours per week into my business. So if I could, you know, really scale that by putting in a limited amount of hours right into my business, but really grow into a full potential and scale that, that was kind of my mindset of wanting to take my business to the next level. And I really felt like doing social media content, YouTube videos was the way to go. Um, and then in terms of the actual business itself, I wanted to be a business owner that really had ownership of my business, that um, whether I was doing this career for a short period of time or a long period of time, I wanted to explode it to the, the maximum potential. Um, and so if that's bringing more people onto my you know, team, hiring more people on and really growing it so that I have more people on my team that are doing things that they can do while I'm doing things that only I as the real estate agent can do. That was kind of like my mindset. Um, so I just really wanted to maximize my time and energy. Um, you know, now I don't have any, uh, children currently, but you know, long-term that is one of our goals. So I understand that as a business owner, you have to kind of pivot with different life stages and changes. And I wanted to set up my business for success, whether we wanted to travel or do different things and just kind of have systems and processes in place that would make it more feasible to do that. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's a couple of ways that I want to take this now. So I, I want to talk first about the social media because, and if you're listening to this, definitely check out Vivian on YouTube, on Instagram, you have a really solid presence across multiple platforms. Um, can you share just a little bit about that journey that you've been on this year? Because I feel like I've really seen your presence kind of evolve and mature and you, you really have identified what you want your brand to look like and how that is going to serve and attracting the right kind of clientele to you. So, so tell me a little bit about, I mean, do you want to start with YouTube or do you want to start with Instagram? Where do you want to take it? Um, well, we can start with Instagram. So I've always been on Instagram and I feel like as a platform, Instagram has evolved. Mm -hmm. um, I joke and say that they kind of are going through like an identity crisis um, a little <laughs> bit. Um, but I've always been, you know, present on Instagram and with all of their changes, I think we all know we try to stay relevant to what is going on within the platform. And I've always loved Instagram, but I've also realized the importance of YouTube. And I've always been fascinated by that platform, you know, years prior to even being an agent, I, I always thought it would be really cool to have a YouTube channel. Um, but there's so many intricacies and layers for starting a channel. Um, so when you and I had our first conversation, I remember you saying like, okay, you need to get on YouTube. And so I said, okay, this is like the final push that I need. Cause my team leader had told me you need to do video. You need to do, you know, um, video content and things like that. And so I think that final conversation you and I had was like really the push to just say like, okay, I'm going to do it. And I committed to posting once a week and I officially started my channel like mid February mm -hmm. and I was consistently posting every single week. And I started my channel with like zero subscribers and it's grown, you know, naturally organically over time. So my strategy really now moving forward is to make YouTube my main platform and filter all my content from there onto Instagram, TikTok, and, you know, other various marketing avenues, but really creating content that you can diversify to specific platforms without feeling overwhelmed of like, I have to create all this content. Like you can really take one piece of content and take a little snip of that and put it on Instagram or post like one or two points and put, uh, put it on TikTok or like even with my monthly market updates, I send that to my database. And, um, you know, that's been a really fun avenue to really explore. And I think um, within YouTube itself, I'm still finding kind of my voice and my style, mm -hmm. but that's been really fun to explore and see kind of like what videos take off and which ones don't. It's really interesting to look at the analytics side of things as well. So 
what I hear when you say that is you're not really tied, like emotionally tied to one specific way of doing it or one specific outcome. And I think that that's something that I love most about, about you and especially working with you in just the sense is seeing how open you are to that experimentation and just kind of letting it evolve naturally. Um, how do you do that? Because there are some agents and, and we hear them all the time where they are paralyzed into inaction because they feel like it has to go a certain way. And they know that if it doesn't, they feel like they've done something wrong. So how did you develop a mindset to kind of stick through it? Because you've been very consistent. Um, you know, that's not to say maybe you've taken some time off here or there, which is totally normal and fine and healthy. Um, but you have stayed committed to that process really well. Whereas I think other agents might feel like they wouldn't have the right, the right, I don't know, mindset or skills to do that. Well, just out of full transparency, I am like a super perfectionist. <laughs> uh, and I think it was on one of our recent calls that you said, perfection is just another word for procrastination. And that really resonated with me because for pretty much like all my life, like I mentioned, I love planning and scheduling things out and you can get so caught up in like the actual goal setting, but then you get stuck on that and there's no action. Um, right. Because we're waiting for all of these things to be like perfect or for, you know, us to be super confident on video or have our outlines or our content just right. And so I think I finally just had to say like, Hey, I'm going to get over myself and it's just not that big of a deal. I'm just going <laughs> to post it and like, see what happens, just post it and, and kind of like detach yourself from the outcome. Um, and that's something that I actually like learned from my husband, my husband's a musician. So, um, he's, you know, been active on YouTube and creating content and things like that. And he's always like, just post it and kind of like, not forget about it, but don't be so enthralled with the vanity metrics of it, because it really can take you through like peaks and valleys. Um, so I think for me, it's just been like, okay, I'm going to do it. And we're just going to see what happens. And if you know, if I'm consistent and I can pivot, if I need to pivot, that's been kind of like my focus and I'm just going to be consistent and, and create content. And if I can get better with each video, that's my goal. Like if this week's video is better than last week's video, whether in lighting or, you know, camera presence or whatever, if it's like even just 1% better, I'm happy. Um, so I'm really more so measuring, I guess, my metrics on that is just improving over time. Do you find now that it's um, easier and faster to kind of like churn out that video content than it was when you started? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think it's definitely one of those things that you just get more comfortable with. Truth be told, the process I like the least is like sitting down and actually writing out the content and like actually figuring out like, okay, what would be relevant for an ideal consumer um, to watch? Like what is really going to resonate with somebody? And I think that's one of the hardest things to develop personally. A lot of people get hung up on being on video or on camera. And I think that's something that you can get better with over time. But for me, it's like the actual like script writing or whatever. Um, but as far as like the workflow of scheduling, the block of time to record and then sending it over to my husband that helps me with a lot of the editing. Um, that process is always evolving and it's always improving, but I think month over month, it's easier to start creating this content. How do you come up with your content ideas? And we've talked about this a lot over the last year of really fine tuning, like, you know, the, the analytical side of looking at the numbers and making those, um, those data driven decisions on what kinds of content to create, how are you scripting those specific videos to make sure that you're speaking directly to your ideal clients? Because it, from, from our conversations, it sounds like we're starting to really see that attraction take place. You're seeing a little bit more of like where these people are coming in and, and you're understanding how that translates to specific groups of potential home buyers and sellers. 
how are you going through that process of speaking to them directly? So in my mind, um, I always think of four videos because usually there's four um, weeks in the month. So I try to target one video in general, just giving an update on the market because the real estate market is like the buzz everywhere. And there's so much misinformation out there of people just wanting to create content for, you know, the views or the clicks on their articles or whatever. So I'm really trying to just communicate the data for what would affect a buyer and a seller looking to buy today and potentially how that investment would be affected in the long run. Granted, like we say, we don't know or can't predict exactly what will happen, you know, six months to a year from now. But I'm just saying like, here's the information, here's the data. And then actually applying that to a buyer or a seller, because if we're just spitting out numbers, it doesn't really help anyone um, in the long run. So that's always like a pillar video within my, you know, content structure and schedule. Then I try to target something for my new construction buyers because new construction is one of my pillars. So that always takes care of one video. So it's, you know, like pros and cons of new construction or a new construction tour or things to watch out for if you're buying new construction. So there is a buyer video. And then I see that a lot of people want to move to Tampa from out of state or out of the city. So I create content that would appeal to somebody wanting to know more about the Tampa Bay area. So it might not necessarily be real estate specific, but more geographical to our area or, you know, like relevant information on like shopping centers or amenities Um, in specific neighborhoods. And then lastly, I try to target my sellers. So, you know, that's information on like navigating this market in the, in the changes in the market. So that's kind of like the, the main content and the main structure that I, that I take. But then obviously if there's like something relevant that's happening in the market or something super unique or something more off the cuff, then I'll also throw that in there as well. I love that. So you've really taken the time to think through kind of the journey that somebody might be taking through Google or YouTube to be searching for solutions or information, and then how you can make sure that you're the person who pops up on the other end of that search. Yeah. And it's been really interesting to see like on the analytics, like specifically what tags people are searching on, on YouTube and just even taking a little bit of time before actually planning out the content and like looking up what people are searching for. There's different like websites that you can like look for frequently asked questions or things like that. And then even thinking back to what questions are sellers asking me or what are buyers asking me yeah. and trying to weave that through the content as well. Um, because I think that's really important. If questions are coming up consistently, then it must mean that many people also are curious about the same thing. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. So, so looking back at the last, I mean, what is that? Is that seven months of doing this pretty consistently? What, what would you say has been your biggest accomplishment so far putting these pieces in place? And then what are we working towards in the next six months? So for me, I think number one is just getting the the action on actually creating the YouTube channel and creating the content for me. That's, I think one of the biggest accomplishments of the year and not just that. And the content is, you know, ever changing and evolving, but I'm consistently growing week over week within my channel. So that's rewarding, right. To feel like, Hey, somebody's watching this, you know? Um, so that's been really, really rewarding, but then also implementing systems and processes all across my business, whether it's, you know, workflows with my customers or things like that, but really focusing on YouTube being the main driver for my business. And I think one of my favorite things about YouTube is that you create content that is evergreen. So Mm -hmm. that content can come up six months from now, a year from now, and somebody could find that video and it could be a potential customer in the long run. And I also love that I can take, um, for example, my video on the home buying journey. And when I have a home buyer consultation with somebody, 
it's probably a little bit overwhelming if that's the very first time they've ever gone through, you know, a buyer consultation. So when I send my follow-up email, I'll include a link to my, you know, here's my video on the buying process and they can go back and reference that later on. Um, so it's really cool to see how you can take one piece of content and use it multiple times, number one. And then number two is generating leads while you sleep. I think that is my favorite part of social media and YouTube, like waking up, seeing a new notification of like, mm -hmm. hey, somebody booked a consultation with you because they found you on Instagram or YouTube. That's really exciting. So I think that's been the biggest accomplishment this year is really putting those pieces into place. I love that. So, so with that, then it sounds like we've also kind of successfully pivoted away um, or pivoted towards really self-generating leads from these different pillars. What do we want to do in the next six months then? What goals um, do you see for yourself going into 2023? So I guess my main goal would be to continue to grow the YouTube channel and continue to generate leads that way. I've also implemented TikTok um, like over the last couple of weeks or like a month ago. And that's a really fun platform. I think I might like it more than Instagram. <laughs> um, Tell me more about that because I love TikTok too. And I actually was able to close a deal on TikTok this year during like a 30 day blitz that I was trying to do a lot of posts. I had one post go viral and it got me one client. And I was like, oh, this is super, super cool. And ever since then, I've been like really, really curious to see what other agents are doing. How like, did were you nervous to get started with TikTok? Because like, I feel like a lot of agents in the industry, I don't know, they kind of want to just like, I don't, what is their attitude about it a little bit? I feel like the attitude can be like, very polar opposites like very dismissive like oh you're just like spending being frivolous with your time on TikTok yeah. and then the other attitude is like oh that's really cool I saw it on TikTok yeah. uh, so I just kind of took a nonchalant approach I had no agenda with it I was just kind of like let's see what happens and I had two videos go pretty viral for me. Um, they had like over 20,000 views. So at the time I had, I think less than a hundred um, followers on TikTok and those two videos just exploded. I was like, what in the world? And my approach has been more so like storytelling or just sharing like candid experiences that no one really talks about because I feel like one of the, main reality checks I got when I got into the industry was that real estate is not sexy and glamorous like they make it out to be on TV. Yeah. It's a lot more work than you realize. So just sharing those kinds of like candid stories um, has been really fun. Um, I haven't gotten any leads from it yet or anything, but it's grown significantly in, in followers. And I think what I really like about it is it's just kind of a carefree platform. Mm -hmm. And as a perfectionist, that's really refreshing because Instagram can feel so like has to look like a certain way in the whole aesthetic. And it's just kind of like, no, just post the content. And um, that's what I really enjoyed about TikTok is, is just kind of like, you know, being more carefree. I will say the comments on there are pretty ruthless. So you kind of have to have like thick skin yeah. and take it with a grain of salt and like, don't take it personal. But I think it's just been an interesting platform to be able to explore. Yeah, I agree. And I like that too. I think that I kind of probably take the same approach where, and I don't post nearly as consistently as I wish that I would. There's a lot more that I feel like I could be doing on, on TikTok. So you're, you're probably ahead of me on that. Um, but I do feel like it's a really good place to develop voice because people do not want you being scripted there. They don't want you to be very polished. Like it's almost, you know, there's, there's a huge trend going on right now, um, that I was listening to somebody speak about recently, probably on TikTok, if I'm being truthful, <laughs> because I get all my news there. But they were saying how early days social media was all about the influencer and celebrities. And these really big brands would gain a huge amount of market share. And now people don't want to see that. And this is where TikTok shines. 
because people on TikTok want to see people like them. They want to see people who, who have real world challenges. They want to see people who are not full-time influencers. Like they want to see people who also are working hard. They have a job, they have other commitments, they have bills to pay. They're not getting a ton of free stuff all the time. And I think that if we can look at that from, from that perspective as an industry, that gives us a lot of opportunity to just as you, what you're doing, share really cool stories that give more perspective, context, and insight into the power that we can bring to somebody's life just from their real estate transaction. Um, so I'm, I'm totally with you. I think it's super cool. Yeah, I, I totally resonate with that. And I think it's more of an unfiltered type of platform, which I think really resonates with people um, because it's just off the cuff and it's real. And so that's what I'm always trying to, I guess, communicate. And, you know, obviously as a business owner and a professional, you want to look professional and you want to, you know, communicate information clearly, but there, it, it becomes really easy to kind of blur that line where everything has to be so scripted and so perfect. So I think for me, I'm consistently trying to find my voice and just really be able to communicate to my ideal customer. Um, and then just feel more confident on just creating content that really resonates with people. Yeah, that's, that is so cool. And, you know, you mentioned the thing about the comments. I think that, um, people are crazy on TikTok with their comments. I sometimes cannot believe it's still a public forum and yeah. I cannot believe some of the words that I see coming out of people's, out of people's phones in the comment section. But because people are so, as you say, unfiltered, especially even in the comments section, it does give you a really interesting tap into what people in your area might be thinking about real estate. And I feel like that that's also another really good source to create new content that you could then repurpose on YouTube or Instagram. Yeah. And I think that's a really fun thing to do on Instagram as well, um, is, you know, translate that, uh, content, but it's funny too, to just kind of be able to see somebody's perspective, like you said, on the real estate market and even, about real estate agents. Um, you know, people have a lot of <laughs> things to say about our industry. And uh, unfortunately, like, you know, we, we can get a bad reputation if not everybody is doing business in an ethical way or doing business with like 100% excellence. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that. And, and that's not just in the real estate industry. That could be in any industry. And so I think that's always something in the back of my mind of like, how can I improve my systems and processes so that somebody has an exceptional customer experience? Because I'm not just after a commission or a transaction. At the end of the day, I want to be able, be able to build a business that lasts um, and you know create generational wealth from my business. So in the back of my mind, I'm always like, how can I maybe take that comment and apply it in a different way or, you know, take somebody's feedback and maybe just ha have a different perspective on how people see our industry and maybe some of the objections that people have when talking to an agent about buying or selling a home. Yeah. And I actually saw one where you did that really well. And there was somebody who had um, some kind of a really nasty comments about just real realtors in general. And, you know, I think that it's even you know, maybe not as a newer agent, but sometimes as a newer agent, that can kind of trip you up a little bit. Like I, I put myself in your shoes when I was two years in the business and I was like a scared little bunny rabbit all the time. Like I didn't have confidence. I didn't feel like I really like deserved to be at the table yet. And that took me a lot of time to develop. And I loved seeing how you head on went and replied to that comment and you were so well-spoken and you said, you know what, it looks like you had, you may have, this might be coming from a really bad experience that you had with a realtor, but let me share with you my perspective on what you're saying here. And it was such an awesome way to kind of turn just what, what was just a negative comment into a productive conversation that really showcases your sense of leadership and the, the way that you're going to show up in your role every day, regardless of what's going on. Yeah. And I think that's just a really, 
um, you know, cool opportunity. And I, and I definitely resonate with what you say, like as a new agent, there's so many things that you feel like, oh my goodness, I have to do content and I have to, your mind is spinning all the time of like feeling like you're pulled in a million directions. Um, so comments like that can really be defeating and discouraging. And I, I just encourage you if you're a newer agent, like just, just let it slide, take it with a grain of salt. Um, you know, we all have our days and we all have our good moments and bad moments. And to that, I will also say that as a newer agent, something I've really had to detach myself from is seeing people's successes on social media and thinking like, okay, they're this far along in their journey. I should be here or I should have X, Y, and Z figured out by now because they've created this illusion online that, you know, everything is amazing. But what you don't see is the behind the scenes of difficult conversations with customers or, you know, challenges in their transactions. So as an agent, I'm also trying to kind of detach myself from measuring my success against what I'm seeing somebody else's success online and realizing that my own journey is completely different than the other agent across the country or even across my neighborhood, right? Um, because there's so many of us. So that's something that I'm continually just trying to remind myself, like, you don't know what is going on, the, the, the behind the scenes of everything and just really trying to celebrate my wins and remembering that, hey, even if there's like a challenging day, having gratitude for the wins that I have had um, and just keeping that mindset as well. Yeah, I think you just made a lot of friends here on the podcast, because I think there's a lot of agents who are probably listening to that who really need that message. So thanks for saying that, Vivian. So, so let's look ahead. Um, one thing that we kind of talked about was like, hey, maybe it would be fun to do a little bit of a live, like a live coaching. So um, I thought maybe what we can do is kind of set a plan for the next 90 days or so for like you say, we, we talk a lot about the non-production victories, right? And that kind of comes from the weight loss community where they say non-scale victories. Right. I'm really obsessed with non-production victories because what, what that means is like attaching to the process is always going to lead to the results that we want to see. Um, so if you're down, we can spend a few minutes talking about um, just kind of like a little bit of a live coaching sesh about some of the things that you're working on, maybe some of the things that we want to tighten up, and then we can do a follow-up 90 days from now or maybe right after the holidays to see how it's going. Does that sound cool? That sounds great. Okay, awesome. So, I mean, I can either start or you can share with me a little bit about some some of the things that you're working on in regards to what we've already covered so far. So, like I was saying, I'm continually, you know, working on expanding my YouTube channel. Ideally, I would want to get to a thousand subscribers, probably not in the next 90 days. That's, I don't think that's realistic, but long term, that's a long term goal of being able to monetize my channel. Right. Creating, um, I guess, kind of like a passive income for my business through YouTube. So, that's like looking long term ahead. So currently right now, I think I'm just at like 220 some subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe three months from now being just around like 350, I think that might be a realistic goal. Okay. Um, just um, going there. Like if I'm, if I'm looking through the end of the year, um, so you've, you have, do you know any, um, do you know any of the metrics as far as like when that growth has come? Because you hit your 100 subscriber mark kind of in like late spring, early summer, right? Yes. So I had a goal of hitting that in the month of June and I hit that way before June. Yeah. Um, I think it was May, but I have noticed that maybe I need to kind of relook at my content because I was, I felt like I was growing a lot in the very beginning, like, um, over seven subscribers a week on average. Um, I have to check my analytics, but I feel like that may have trickled off a little bit. I'm still gaining subscribers, but maybe I need to tweak my content just a little bit. Maybe, um, you know, post another video that does really well. Um, because back in March, I posted a pros and cons of 
living in a specific city. And that video did really, really well unexpectedly. And so I did another pro and con video of a different city and it didn't do as well as I thought it would. Um, mm -hmm. So that first video, I guess, was specific to Wesley Chapel. So maybe it's more Wesley Chapel content instead of Tampa, ironically. Um, but Wesley Chapel is more so like a suburb of the Tampa Bay area. So I didn't want to go so hyper-focused that I might be missing like a bigger metro area. Yeah. Um, so ironically, that Wesley Chapel video did really, really well. So I think a lot of the subscribers came from there. Um, but I'm continually posting, you know, content. I also have a series in mind highlighting like the best neighborhoods in the Tampa Bay area. And they're going to be more like vlog style content. Um, so touring those specific neighborhoods and like getting more like B-roll footage to make it more interactive. So that's one of my goals um, because all of my videos have been like kind of in a set type setting. Yeah. So I'm going to incorporate more vlog style videos as well. And I think that'll kind of mix up the content a little bit. Okay. I think that those are, because um, your videos do get really high views, like for only, not only, but for having 200, and I, I'm looking at them now, for having 222 subscribers right now, you have, you've posted over 30 videos so far, which um, is there's something we we're talking about. There's something that happens after you get over that, like 25 to 30 video mark, like stuff really starts to happen after that, which is um, inconvenient for a lot of agents who want those quick results, <laughs> but <laughs> it's okay. Right. Yeah. Um, but I'm just looking right now. You, you do have a lot of really high viewed videos. Um, so I, I think that keep doing what you're doing. I think you, you tend to have a really good intuition on that content that you're posting. And I know it's a lot of stuff that we talk about during the coaching calls too. So let's just keep kind of doing that. But what I want to think about is how can we um, get more subscribers right off the bat? And a lot of times that has less because reach is not your problem problem right, right now. You're getting enough views to where we, we can be seeing more subscribers. So it might be something to do with a little bit about I, and I haven't looked at any videos. So I'm just going to start spitballing ideas. Um, how are you starting your videos? What does the typical intro sound like for you? Um, so I'll do kind of like a question or a hook. Um, and then I'll say in today's video, I'll be addressing X, Y, and Z. So that's kind of my introduction. And then I say my name, where I'm based out of, and I explain that I'm a real estate agent. I try to mix it up and keep the intros short and then towards the middle, say something along the lines of, Hey, and by the way, if you're looking to buy or sell, I would be more than happy to have a buyer consultation or a consultation with you. So that's kind of my intro. I started doing something over the last couple of videos where right in the middle of the video, I'll say something like something like, Oh, um, we'll get back to the content, but go leave me a comment below. Pause this video and tell me where you're watching from or creating some form of way for people to engage like midway through the video. Um, so I'm always trying to explore kind of like different things to do to create that retention because usually it trickles off towards like half or two thirds of the way through. Sure. But I, I, I struggle with not making the introduction too long, but, n but also not giving credibility of like who I am or what I do to have somebody want to connect with me, if that makes sense. I totally hear you. And I kind of struggled with this too myself for a while. And from my perspective, I think there is so much information now on the internet that people are reading that they're going, they don't need to be told whether or not they need to believe you. They're going to decide that within the first couple of seconds on their own, just because they have their own internal filter so dialed in from how much content they're consuming. And right. so because of because of that, I I never introduce myself anymore. <laughs> I I have all of my obviously my compliance information on my on my captions. Um, but I've kind of gotten away from I used to have really lengthy um like intros and like you know, I really tried to make sure, and I was thinking like, well, if this is their first impression with me, they need to know who I am. But I noticed that for myself, 
the moment somebody, even on TikTok, and it's a really big thing on TikTok where they'll do that hook and they'll like really kind of get you invested. And they'll say, by the way, I am a da 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 da. And they have their little credibility moments. The moment they start doing that, I kind of lose interest and I swipe. Yeah. And I noticed I was doing that. And so I took that out of my video altogether because I decided to just trust that if the audience wants to find a way to like learn more about who I am, they're going to do that after binging like seven videos in a row. And right. then they'll decide whether or not they, they want to take that step further with me. So my job from my perspective that I've been experimenting with specifically on YouTube is to make it as, as low friction as, as possible for them to um, just consume the content and get retention high. And the, the metrics that you want to go when you go into the analytics in YouTube studio, what you want to do is be filtering for your audience. And then you also want to be filtering for the subscribers. So if you go into the audience tab, mm -hmm. what you'll, what you'll find is like specifically the subscribers and you'll be able to see when you get little peaks of subscribers, what I would do is try to filter for all time and see the videos that had the highest number of new subscribers. And this is a lot of the numbers and maybe you're already doing this. Are you already doing this or no? I haven't tried the all time like okay. what you're mentioning right now. Okay. So every month when you go to write your scripts, okay, go through and see which videos all time, all recent, because as you said, these videos are evergreen. People right. are going to subscribe to videos that you posted two years ago, a year ago, right? Like over time as you continue right. doing this. And sometimes like I've had videos that ended up really kicking off and getting pushed out that were over six months old. Okay. And your channel is getting to that seasoning where it's going to start doing that, where these older videos that you, that might be out of sight, out of mind for you, for whatever reason, will start to really gain traction. And you want to make sure that you're looking at which videos currently today are getting subscribers. And I would rewatch those videos every time you go to sit down and write your scripts and try to decide like, what about that? Was there a specific way that you told somebody to subscribe? Or was there a specific way that you did the intro that maybe led somebody to want to su subscribe and try to like, you're really good at this. You're, you're already a little scientist. So try to pinpoint what you think that might be. And I think that might help. And the other thing that you might do too, and I'm not sure if you're doing this, but do you put any on-screen graphics about subscribing? Yes, I do. Okay. I put, I've also um, posted on like the lower thirds, like my name, my email and my um, phone number, because I know we're trying to filter everybody through our booking system. But I was noticing that I actually got a lot more people reaching out to me directly to my phone number and email cool. instead of just saying, hey, book a call on my calendar. Um, so once they actually make the first contact, whether email or phone, hey, thanks so much for reaching out. I'd love to have like a personal one on one with you for your convenience. Here's a link to my calendar. And I guess it feels a little bit less kind of intrusive or um I don't know. It seems a little bit more approachable. So I've started implementing that and I leave both options in the description of the video, but I've noticed that really leaving my contact info on screen um, is super helpful. Yeah. I, I think that I probably did this, the same thing, but what I did was I started sending people to my YouTube or, okay. or my Instagram. I mean, Oh, to book a, a consultation to through your Instagram. Right. So not necessarily that, but to DM me on Instagram. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. And so maybe that's something that you also experiment with. Are you plugging your Instagram? Um, I don't really mention it in a lot of my videos. I'll put, you know, the Instagram handle on there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've necessarily gotten like followers directly from uh, YouTube, unless like somebody flat out says, oh yeah, I followed you because I, you know, saw you on YouTube. I don't know if there's any correlation, but I don't really bring up my, um, I mean, my Instagram. Yeah. I kind of do it in conversation, um, where if I'm answering a question or if I am highlighting a, spe a specific neighborhood, like, like you might be, that's where you can say, Hey, by the way, I do a lot of these on Instagram. You can check me out there. 
And, and what that does is YouTube is just a moment in time for somebody, right? But they, they're going to YouTube because they need something in that moment, but right. they're going to be on TikTok and Instagram daily. Um, so, so what that allows you to do is just kind of take that audience, um, you're getting that broad reach on YouTube, and then it allows you to bring them into a secondary platform where they're going to be more often and see you more top of mind. So just, just a, a tip. Yeah, I'm going to try that. And just to see and create that conversation on there as well. I love it. I th- I think if we if we get really curious about a couple of those things, what I would want to see is you getting to four or five hundred followers by the end of the year. Okay. I don't okay. think that's like outside of the realm of possibility. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good goal for okay. sure. And, and just um, also creating like the tours and the more vlog style content. I think that's really appealing for people. Um, so yeah, I think that's reasonable. Okay. And then if I'm looking really quickly, I just want to look one more time. Cause I was, I was kind of checking out your, your, your area specific, your geographical, like focus videos really do get, get a lot of traction. I think that what you could also consider doing is maybe one video a month. And this is something that I'm testing right now currently too. One video a month, um, trying to go, f- I know we don't want to be those agents that are going for clickbait, but just trying to go for a broader reach. Right. right? And so what that means to me is um, talking about like the news headlines, like what's happening in the market. Um, what is the fed doing? Is the market crashing? Like just answering those more provocative questions. And what I would be doing for that is looking on the TikTok comments. Okay. That's a great idea. Yeah. And, and what that's going to do is that's going to, that's going to do something really important for you. So we, we want to make sure that we're maintaining local audience levels, right? We want the majority of people to be subscribing to you that are from like the Tampa area, Mm -hmm. but in posting videos that are designed to get a more broad reach. So maybe answering questions on a more national level like that, and especially things that are very current, that's going to create breakthrough videos that are going to be pushed out to the greater space in YouTube. And if you're doing what you're already doing, meaning making sure your YouTube videos are high quality and thinking about how to maintain retention, that's just going to have trickle down to the rest of your audience. So you're going to get a big inflection of views, Mm -hmm. but YouTube is going to say, oh, okay, so this was kind of a headline that we wanted to push out to the greater audience. But with all of these new views, this is really supporting that Vivian makes really good content because her retention is up, her click-through rate is up, all these other numbers are really high. So that next time when you post a more geographical, like geographic specific video, you're going to be more likely to be seen in front of a, a larger audience in your area. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And it- like visually it makes me think of a funnel kind of like a broader video and then like very hyper specific content um and just keeping that on rotation so i think i'm definitely going to implement that as well just to have a a broader reach yeah yeah i love that i think if we have a couple of those little things that we can test you can do that and i know you're going to do that because you always follow through on what you say you're going to do and then we can kind of loop back in here a couple of months and just kind of see how it went. Does that okay. sound cool? Yeah, that sounds great. I love it. Yeah, how else, how else can I help you while I've got you, Vivian? Um, well, another thing I'm implementing in my business is farming. So I'm going to pick a new farm community. I did that last year. And I like when when you're really starting a business, like pinching pennies, like you do everything in your power, Uh (laughs) like spend the least amount of money, but the cost is your time. So I would send like handwritten farming letters and address the envelopes. Um, And I put that on pause when I started like the whole YouTube and social media, because that takes a a while to get going. Um, So for like this last um, quarter, I want to also implement farming to have that more on autopilot. And I, I think we've talked about that prior, mm-hmm. uh, 
So I'm just going to really pick a, a good community and have that more on an automated type thing. And so have like multiple funnels, like through social media, then that more like direct mail type prospecting. And then, um, I guess just kind of like working that all in together. Um, so that's just kind of like the big picture, um, long-term is having that kind of on autopilot as well. Do you live near the community you think that you're going to farm? I haven't picked a community yet. Um, I was looking into a couple and I was going to do a micro community. Okay. I decided like, Hey, if I'm going to make the investment, I think I'm going to pick a community that's at a little bit higher of a price point. Um, just so that it's kind of like worth it. Um, so I'm glad I like re looked at that and I said, Oh no, I'm going to pick a little bit of a higher price point for that. Okay. So when you're doing that, are you going to look a little bit at the turnover metrics and just see like how many homes are selling in that smaller community, that kind of stuff? Yep. I'm, I'm going to do that as well. And looking into that and I want to keep it, you know, at a smaller, um, scale yeah. because I want to be able to also add like my own touch of branding or personalization in one way or another because I know everybody and their mother is getting bombarded with, with stuff in the mail. So I want to have that on autopilot, but maybe incorporate something else into that, that kind of like, I don't know, like sticks out, maybe put like a QR code to my YouTube channel into that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm thinking in terms of that, or maybe even like, um, some sort of like connection with like people who just move into the community and introducing myself as like the neighborhood agent, something like that. I'm kind of still brainstorming ideas on how I can make it just a little bit more special than just like what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Have you decided on a mailing distribution solution yet? Yes. And I'm pretty much set on going with core fact. Cool. Um, so I have that chosen. Um, but I want to be able to add like something else into that to make it a little bit different. Yeah. So, so my suggestions would be definitely doing the QR code to your YouTube channel. Okay. Absolutely. Like I would make sure that that's on every single one. And what you could even do is like, if you have a specific video that you feel like is really in line with that, with that community, you could, you could change out that QR code every month if you wanted to. Okay. like even to your market updates like that kind of stuff you can totally do um they should be able to work with you on that because i use poor fact too so totally big fan obviously um there was another thing that i was going to mention around that so you're going to do the youtube you wanted to do the welcome so I would absolutely do that too. So what I would do is have an auto search onto the neighborhood on the MLS every single day. So you're going to have an automated, like from your MLS mm -hmm. with those parameters, you're going to be notified anytime there's a new listing canceled, pending, closed, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. As soon as they close, then you can send that, that welcome little thing. And, and I would absolutely do that. I would come up with that cute little template you can either hand it off um, in person or that one would probably make sense to just like print it off on, on, have it printed on really good paper or whatever, and then write that handwritten notes. And you can even include like a little neighborhood guide, right? So maybe this is kind of where your thought was already, but um, you know, your, your favorite spots for like coffee or um, you know, natural, what is the word that you use? You have such a cool brand where you focus on, natural Living. holistic holistic yeah. yeah i would so so highlighting local businesses that you've connected with that kind of stuff i would absolutely be doing that for sure okay awesome yep yeah. and another goal of mine has been to connect with uh professionals in the area so i'm growing my my list for that so at the end of the year i hope to be at like 50 people that I've had like some sort of one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's in person or like a zoom. Cause some, some people, um, just don't have the availability for in person, but at least creating that, um, connection and hopefully focusing more on like those more holistic organic brands. And then also, you know, top professionals that are relevant for a homeowner or a home seller, um, with, you know, 
different things that I could recommend or vendors and things like that. So that's something I'm actively working on as well. Yeah, totally. Carpet cleaning, deck sealing. Um, I'm assuming maybe you have something like that in your area. Just looking at the house specifically too, and making sure that you have those really good vendors too, because you could even create a preferred vendors list yeah. um, that you have that you can send out to people as well when they move in. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working on that, making my way, doing those one-on-one -on -one connections. So um, and trying just to go to more networking events as like an introvert, that's like so uncomfortable, but I'm trying to like put myself out there and just do that. Yeah, I agree. It's painful for me too, <laughs> but it's so important too. And, and every time it gets a little bit easier, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. So, so we're going to follow up and we're going to talk about the YouTube goals that you've set next time. We're going to talk about the farming. So we'll get an update on the farming and how that's going. And I think that if you could even uh, make sure that there's a way that you can track who's clicking that link to your QR code, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, but that might help give you an indication of like whether or not people are looking you up. They absolutely will. Um, and Core Fact is going to do a lot of that on their end too. And then the top 50 professionals by the end of the year. And I think if you have those pieces in place by January 1, like that's going to have you on a really, really good path to just maintaining and growing momentum. That's the goal. <laughs> Love it. Oh, I can't wait to hear how it goes. Well, this has been great. Thanks so much. And I'm excited and looking forward to that. I know the last like three months of the year, it can be easy just to feel like, oh, I'm just going to coast through the end of the year. And I think it's like really the time to like, get your head down and like really finish off the year strong to like start off 2023, which is crazy to say, um, you know, and hit the ground running in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Vivian. And if you're listening to this and you want to connect with Vivian, check out her YouTube, check out her TikTok, her Instagram. I'll make sure that I have all those details in the captions so that you can just head right on over and connect. But definitely do because Vivian, you are you are exactly what this real estate industry needs. Like you have such a fresh, fresh perspective. You're so hardworking and you're so committed to the process. And I think that those are traits that all agents kind of in your same world of, of experience and, and where you want to go with your business. That is something that everybody can look to and be inspired. So thank you so much for coming and sharing your story with us today. Thank you so much for having me. This was really a pleasure to be a part of. Thank you again. My pleasure. We'll talk soon.